Topic notes 3.3, primary productivity. This is a picture from Juneau, Alaska, and I got the chance to see humpback whales doing what they call bubble net feeding, which is where they make a circle of bubbles that sort of encloses their prey, which is mostly zooplankton, like shrimps and little fish and things like that. And then they take turns coming up in the middle to gulp them down. It's really cool to see. And the reason why these humpbacks are in Alaska doing that is because there's it's an area of high productivity. Uh, and that is, of course, the topic of today's notes, marine productivity. There's a lot of nuts and bolts today in terms of learning goals, but let's again focus on that main idea. Producers harness an energy source through either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis to convert inorganic substances to organic substances, which contain energy that supports the food web. Now, we mentioned in the last set of notes that the sun is essential to life on this planet, uh, with the exception of chemosynthesis, which we will get into in this note set as well. So let's define a few things. Primary productivity is the rate of production of new biomass through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, because that's essentially what we're doing, right? Um, photosynthesis is producing those organic molecules, and they're being used in bodily processes to grow and get larger and replace skin and all that sort of stuff. Biomass is the mass of living material in an area. It can be measured as dry mass without water or wet mass with water. Now the term biomass is going to become important later on because we're going to be measuring primary productivity and one of the ways you can do that is through measuring biomass. Now, photosynthesis is a biological process in which light energy from the sun is captured and transformed into chemical energy of carbohydrates, glucose, essentially. Now, light energy is absorbed by pigments, most commonly chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll is found in organelles called chloroplasts. So when you hear those terms, that's what they mean. Now, here is the balanced equation for photosynthesis. We have six molecules of carbon dioxide, 12 molecules of water. Then, of course, you enter radiant energy in the form of sunlight, or we're going to talk about later, chemical energy. And then you get out one molecule of glucose, six molecules of water, and six molecules of oxygen. Plants, phytoplankton, algae, and even some bacteria perform photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis produces the raw materials for producing biomass. And oxygen is produced as a waste product and can be used in respiration. And yes, plants do go through cellular respiration, just like animals do. We don't often think about it that way. In this diagram to the right, you'll see this leaf as an icon, and you have a photosynthesis side during the day and a respiration side at night and during the day, because respiration happens both night and day. On the photosynthesis side, you can see where carbon dioxide is being taken in from the atmosphere, water is being taken through the um, leaf veins, and then you have sunlight being added in, and then that all combines, and you produce oxygen as a waste product, which goes back out into the atmosphere. And then, of course, you have carbohydrates being produced through the process of photosynthesis, and then it's going through cellular respiration, and it's releasing water, carbon dioxide as well, and, and the leaf is taking up oxygen too. So all of this stuff is happening in the plant. Now you're probably pretty familiar with primary producers on land, right? You've got trees, you've got shrubs, you've got grass, things like that. No problem. But then the ocean, what is actually going through primary productivity in the ocean? Well, 99% of the primary productivity in the ocean comes from the really tiny stuff, phytoplankton, pictured on the far left.
Now, in coastal regions, you do have things like seagrasses and mangroves and algaes that also add to that productivity as well. And in corals, we actually have uh, algae called zooxanthellae that live inside the coral tissue in a coral reef. And the algae produces food for the coral and the coral provides a shelter and nutrients to the algae. So that's kind of neat. But the vast majority of it is all that really tiny stuff, the plankton. Now the ocean itself has no large scale accumulation of biomass as you would on land. Think about it this way. You're not going to go in the ocean and see a vast forest with all of that, you know, the trunk of the trees and all the leaves and things like that. It's mostly all based on that really tiny stuff, the phytoplankton. Now the thing is, is that small stuff, the phytoplankton has a really high reproductive rate. So it's being replaced constantly. And that sort of replaces or takes the place of having so much large biomass as you do on terrestrial habitats, but it keeps the system going in the ocean. Now let's look at the factors that affect photosynthesis in the ocean. Now the first we're going to look at are really not significant factors and students always get kind of messed up with this and think they are, so please get that clear. Temperature and carbon dioxide don't really matter a whole lot, and this is why. Temperature is a lesser factor than on land because temperature is very stable in the water. Remember that whole high specific heat thing that we were talking about in terms of the chemistry? There's usually a very gradual change. Um, and so that's why you generally don't see a lot of impact. Now, there is some, for sure. Warmer water, usually you can have higher productivity, but it's just minimal considering where you're at latitudinally whenever you're doing a study, things like that. Now, carbon dioxide is very abundant in the ocean. There's no real limiting factor there. It's It comes in through atmospheric dissolution. It comes in through respiration. It's pretty much everywhere. So that's not limiting anything at all. So remember, temperature and carbon dioxide, they can obviously be factors if they're withheld, but they're generally very insignificant in the grand scheme of things in the ocean. Now, nutrients, on the other hand, is a really big deal. Algae and plants require nutrients in the form of mineral ions in order to grow, stuff like phosphates and nitrates, things like that. And lacking of nutrients can reduce the rate of productivity. And you can see that here in ocean phosphate concentrations globally. You'll notice that a good chunk of the ocean, especially in the tropical latitudes, are essentially nutrient deserts. They don't have a lot of phosphate in them at all. And areas where you do see a lot of phosphate, that actually correlates with areas of high productivity. So nutrient availability is a key, key factor in whether you have productivity in an area or not. And right up there with nutrients is light. Obviously, if you don't have sunlight, you don't have photosynthesis, you don't have productivity, right? It's really important. And generally photosynthesis can only occur in what we call the photic zone, that layer of the ocean where there's enough light for photosynthesis. Now this tends to be in the first 200 meters of the ocean. In fact, that's where the majority of the biomass in the ocean is. And you can see in this right, in the diagram to the right, You'll notice the rainbow color, right? If you've ever dived down into the ocean, you probably notice that it looks very blue, right? The deeper you go. That's because the reds and yellows and greens, they tend to get, those are, um, th those tend to get absorbed in the water first. And then the more high energy blue goes down farther into the ocean. So that's why you see that. And various different types of algaes and phytoplankton, things like that, are able to function in different levels of light. You can see where um, you got chlorophytes, you got rhodophyta, you got, uh, those are different types of algae, green algae, brown algae, things like that. Dinoflagellates, diatoms, these are all different types of plankton you're going to learn about later. And But essentially the take home is, is they all exist at different levels in depths in the ocean based on what they can get from the light. So why does the light not get very deep? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, light is scattered and absorbed by the water. Waves can reflect the light in, at the surface, reflect it back. And the more waves, the more reflection you get, right? 
Light is also uh, refracted as it enters the water. There's essentially a change in direction because the light's going to move slower in water compared to air because, of course, water is more viscous. It's more thick, right? We talked about that with hydrogen bonding and all that stuff. Um, and also there's suspended particles in the water that can absorb and scatter the light as well. So it's only those shorter wavelength lights that make it deeper, but even they get filtered out eventually. So now we're going to kind of combine a couple of things. We're going to talk about density, but sunlight and temperature are kind of tied into this. Um, the absorption of sunlight by water also increases the temperature. Now, as you increase temperature, that's going to decrease density. We know that because you're increasing the molecular motion of the water. They get spread, you know, molecules get spread farther apart and get lower density, right? The warmer low density surface layer helps actually keep phytoplankton near the surface, which is actually really good. Um, but the colder, denser water below uh, it creates essentially that thermocline or pycnocline, as we talked about before, and that creates a bit of a density barrier. It also traps nutrients in the deep water, which we'll talk about later. So that that sort of is the, the issue with density. Density has to do with that layering of the ocean, creating those density barriers, and it is tied to temperature as well, and to some degree salinity, depending on where you are. Now there is something called the deep chlorophyll maximum, the DCM, which is the point near the thermocline where the productivity is the highest as there is enough light for photosynthesis and enough nutrients for growth. So let's break this down for a minute. Most nutrients are trapped in the deep water in the ocean. The reason for that is because a lot of the living organisms in the ocean as they die, their bodies go into the deep water. Now, when this occurs, that's when decomposition goes on and the nutrients are re-released into the water. This is key, of course, to uh, making nutrients available again for more living organisms. But the problem is here is a lot of it gets trapped in the deep water because of that density barrier we just talked about. So here's what are the two things we need the most? We need sunlight and we need nutrients for productivity. The sunlight is at the surface. The nutrients are in the deep water. Do you see where there's an issue here, right? And so the deep chlorophyll maximum is where those two really important factors meet at their peak for photosynthesis to occur. And it's called the deep chlorophyll maximum. And you can see it on this graph on the right. You can see the nutrient level increase as you go deeper. You can see the irradiance or the essentially the sunlight increase as you go towards the surface. And you can see the chlorophyll line of the chlorophyll there get really high around the thermocline. That's where that balance is between access to nutrients and access to sunlight. Now, seasonality is a big deal as well, especially in different latitudes. So light varies with seasons more dramatically in higher latitudes, essentially polar regions. In the spring, the average day length and light intensity both increase, which increases productivity. In the winter, it experiences shorter days and less intensity, and thus it decreases productivity. Now remember, nutrient availability is one of the key factors in whether or not you have a lot of productivity in general. If you look at the graph on the right, you'll see the line for tropical regions, right? From January to January, every month, you'll notice that that productivity line for tropical regions is relatively low and it's consistent. Part of that reason is because the surface waters are always relatively warm, low density, and deeper you have the cooler, low density water, and the two don't mix very much because there's a substantial difference in density between them. So that density barrier is pretty high, so the nutrients in the deep water don't really come up, and thus you don't have a lot of productivity in the surface waters, such as you see on the graph for tropical regions. Now this starts to change when you get into the northern temperate region, so we're not fully at the pole yet, and that's where that first large hump comes into play around March, April, May. 
Now the reason for that first bump is there is actually excess nutrients in the surface waters. How did it get there? In the winter, if you look at like December, January, that kind of time frame, the water is much cooler in the surface waters in the temperate regions, and thus the difference between densities in the surface water and the deep water is less, and that allows mixing to occur. So essentially you start to nutrient load the surface waters. But as you get into the spring, that density layer starts to form again because the surface waters start to get warm, and thus it cuts it off. So you have this blip of high productivity around March, April, May as you're in the spring, um, because the phytoplankton is using up all of that nutrients. And of course, the zooplankton, which is on the dotted line there, that um, cycle kind of kicks in and you see that uh, peak right after the phytoplankton peak, probably more May into June. Um, and so that's the temperate region. Now, the second peak you see on the graph is for the northern polar. So this would be polar regions in general. And now the density difference between uh, summer and winter between surface and deep water in the polar regions is much less in general. So you tend to have more nutrients available. But the big difference here is, of course, the amount of light available and temperature a little bit too. And so you have that spike around uh, June and July and August. And of course, the spike in phytoplankton is followed by the spike in zooplankton and then of course it goes down as the short you know you get shorter and shorter days less light all that and of course more ice uh, covering the surface as well now this is the reason why whales migrate during the summer they go up into these northern temperate and polar regions because there's a lot of productivity and they have a lot of food sources and then of course in the winter they come back down into the tropics now we've been talking primarily about photosynthesis, but of course we do have chemosynthesis as well, which is the process where carbon dioxide is turned into usable organic molecule carbohydrates using the energy stored in dissolved chemicals like hydrogen sulfide. So we have something called chemoautotrophs, which are organisms which are able to use chemical energy to synthesize organic materials. Now, just a brief reminder, the processes that go on here, minerals dissolved in these heated water under the ocean crust essentially come out in these vents. And this heated water is rich in hydrogen sulfide and other minerals that make its way back to that seafloor, and then organisms utilize that. Chemosynthetic bacteria are able to make their own food using that chemical energy. And each species uses different chemicals as energy sources and produce different sugars. So there is, like with photosynthesis, it's pretty straightforward. It's one equation. But with the uh, chemosynthetic bacteria, there's actually several equations. This is just an example of one using hydrogen sulfide, which is a great example to use in responses on you know, your tests and stuff. Keep in mind that these hydrothermal vents exist in the aphotic zone. There's no light. And the chemosynthesis is the only way to support the biodiversity that you see there because most of the seafloor is really rather sparse in terms of living things. And this brings us to a new term called extremophiles, which is an organism that is adapted to survive in extreme temperatures, pressure, salinity, or pH. And hydrothermal vents definitely fit this bill because they're extremely high pressure and their temperatures range between 2 degrees Celsius to 400 degrees Celsius. Now, an example of an extremophile is the Pompeii worm. Now, a Pompeii worm is described as possibly being one of the most heat tolerant animals in the world. It is a deep sea polychaete that resides in tubes near hydrothermal vents along the seafloor. And a polychaete is, is related to the earthworm, just so you kind of get an idea. They can reach up to five inches long and their tail end is often resting in temperatures as high as 176 degrees Fahrenheit while their feather-like heads stick out of the tubes in water that is much cooler, kind of more around the line of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a huge temperature difference. And we're tr still trying to understand the extreme nature of these uh, particular animals. They actually have a, a type of bacteria that forms a bit of a fleece-like covering on their backs, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's this symbiotic relationship, and also there's these mucus glands um, that are on their backs. So there's all this stuff that we're still trying to sort out, um, which is why exploring these hydrothermal vents is just so incredibly fun and cool. Now, 75% of the organisms 
in hydrothermal vents depend on this mutualistic relationship between the chemosynthetic bacteria. Now the tube worms Riftia, which have those red plumes on them, they're very iconic for the uh, hydrothermal vents, provide a home and nutrients for this chemo chemosynthetic bacteria. It's that symbiotic relationship. Um, but they're not the only ones. Even mussels at the vents, which are a type of clam-like animal, uh, have mutualistic bacteria in their gills, um, but they also filter feed. So there's kind of a duality there. And just so you get an idea of what these uh, worms, the Eurifteas, look like outside of their tubes, this is a robot arm grabbing a crab that has a tube worm pulled out of its tube in its claw. Kind of an interesting juxtaposition there. So let's just go through some differences and similarities between chemo and photosynthesis. Both use carbon dioxide and both require energy sources to produce sugars. Now differences, photosynthesis produces oxygen as a byproduct, while chemosynthesis pro produces byproducts that kind of vary from species to species, but sulfur is usually produced. Only one possible equation for photosynthesis where, again, there's multiple equations for chemosynthesis. Both use sugar produced to provide metabolic energy through respiration. Now, speaking of respiration, respiration is the process by which all living things release energy from their food by oxidizing glucose. The energy is then used to carry out all the different metabolic reactions within an organism. So aerobic respiration is shown below in this chemical equation. It's the reverse of photosynthesis. You have carbohydrates, then oxygen and water, and then you turn that into carbon dioxide, which you release, water, which we release, and energy, which is then released and used by the organism. Much of the energy produced is heat, energy, and is released into the environment wastefully so, which we'll get into soon. Now, just to wrap this up, there's a huge influence of productivity on the food chain and the food webs that we're going to talk about throughout the course. The higher productivity increases biomass of producers and thus increases the biomass available for consumers. So essentially the more productivity, the more life you have going on in the area. Higher productivity leads to more abundant populations of consumers and longer food chains. And in fact, in the ocean, we tend to have longer food chains than we do on land. We also, high productivity is controlled by the availability of two things, nutrients and light, two very, very important concepts to remember. Okay, I know that was a lot, but here's that main idea again, right? Producers harness an energy source through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis to convert inorganic substances to organic substances, which contain energy that supports the food web. All right, guys, until next time, keep learning.